Uh. Ooh, yeah. Drop that beat. It's time to meet DP. So, welcome back, guys, to another episode of DP and... It's time for a Rewind Remix. What? Oh, don't act like you don't know what you're talking about. You planned this thing all along, didn't you? Okay, well, yeah, it is sort of planned, sort of not. Unfortunately, the guests I had this week, we had some recording difficulties, and we're not going to be able to do an episode this week with that particular guest, but I hope to have them on next week, and we'll have everything nice and grand, and my, hopefully my internet won't be all messed up like it was before. But the Rewind Remix is a way that I can still put out content whenever I don't have access to guests. I can still put out a good show for you guys, you know, something that'd be nice and entertaining for you to listen to. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is I'm going to mix in some videos of things that I've done in the past, but obviously they're in audio-friendly format since this is a podcast, after all, not a video. And so I'm going to be choosing only videos that are listenable in a podcast format, and we're going to play those back and I'm also going to offer a little bit of commentary uh, along with those videos as far as times have changed, you know, because some of these videos are actually really old, and so I want to offer a little bit of additional insight as to what's happened with those things. But I do still want to cover some recent gaming news as well with this episode. Okay, so now on to the gaming news. First of all, Capcom is teaming up with I Am 8-Bit in order to release a limited edition Street Fighter 2 cartridge, which has a limited quantity of 5500, 4400 are in a red cartridge, and the other 1100 are in a glow-in-the-dark Blanca cartridge, which sounds like a really interesting thing. But there is a couple of problems I have with this, people. First of all, they are charging $100. One dollars hundred dollars one hundred dollars for this limited edition cartridge which is essentially a reproduction cartridge there's nothing different with it i'm sure maybe they'll update the rom in order to show 2017 capcom or something like that but other than that it'll essentially be the exact same game that we've played on our super nintendo's a long time ago and on top of that this thing apparently has a warning saying that you could potentially burn your console by putting this game into your system. What a dumb idea that is. Who in their right mind would actually purchase something like that? Which, uh, by the way, I'm sure by the time you guys hear this episode, it's probably already sold out. But come on. Why are people excited over this? This just doesn't make any sense. Let me know what you guys think. Write up The Down Phoenix Show at gmail.com let me know if you think there's a place for things like this that being said i'm all about re-releasing old games brand new again but let's not do it this way this is just an insulting way that just hurts the industry as a whole okay and we're gonna kind of split things up a bit i'm not gonna just spit out all the news at once because i want you guys to actually listen to the whole episode so we're gonna dive right into the first classic clip which this was recorded back in 2015, February of 2015 to be exact. Uh, just to kind of take you back some of the times, this was around the time that the Order 1886 was released for the PlayStation 4. And the video that I recorded at this time was in regards to that particular game, as well as comparing to some other games. Uh, so this is a piece titled, In Defense of Short Video Games. Hey guys, Down Phoenix here, and I wanted to hop on for a quick gaming vlog about length of video games. Um, this has been a very controversial and hot topic lately because of the Order 1886. So the game just launched today for the PlayStation 4 exclusively, and it is Sony's latest first-party game on the console. And the game was designed basically to help sell PlayStation 4 systems. And it looks like with the latest news, it's not going to do a very good job of that. Um, not to mention the poor review scores it's been getting. It's currently a little under 70 on Metacritic. With some scores as low as, I think I saw a 2 out of 10. 
on uh, one of the reviews. That's uh, really crazy. You know, some reviewers have been giving it like eights and whatnot, but uh, obviously when you have someone giving it a two out of ten, you know, that's going to really skew things a lot. So, anyways, I do want to point out that this particular game has been the subject of a massive hype train. And obviously that was very deliberate um, from the very first time the game was revealed back in 2013 with its uh, cinematic uh, teaser that made people think it was something else entirely from what it ended up being. Um, but the game really started getting a lot of flack whenever it got news about apparently a five-hour campaign because there was a YouTube user called Play Me Through, which I think they might be banned from YouTube now. Um, probably would be very wise of Sony to uh, disperse at that, right? But um, they posted a playthrough of the game from start to finish, which took a little more than five hours to complete. And... Not just that, but there was also a lot of issues like quick time events being very rampant, a lot of cutscenes, not a lot of gameplay, a uh, couple of hours worth of gameplay within that five hour period. Uh, now, you do have to bear in mind that that was definitely on the short end of things because it seems like most people that are playing the game now are saying that the range, the actual range of the game is more in the 7 to 10 hour range. Um, some people have taken as long as 12 hours to complete it. Um, I guess it just ultimately depends on your own pace, uh, how fast you play through a game, as well as the difficulty setting that you're playing on. You know, those are all going to be factors. If you're playing in a harder difficulty setting, you're probably going to die more often and have to repeat certain parts more often. And that's... You know, just kind of the nature of the game, right? Okay, so I just want to interject real quick, just to let you guys know my general thoughts on The Order 1886, because I have actually played the game after I filmed this video originally, and I actually enjoyed the game quite a bit. A lot of people did complain about it, of course, but I didn't really see the complaints as being that serious of a deal myself. I really enjoyed the storyline and the cinematics of the game, and the graphics were mind-blowing for the time. And I highly recommend giving it a try, even if you're not into cinematic games. You never know, it might surprise you. But that being said, I would not pay too much for the game. I think maybe about $10 or less would probably be the price to pay. I wouldn't pay any more than that. And it's not hard to find it for 10 bucks or less anyway, so why pay more? But anyways, let's go ahead and get back to the clip at hand. But um, this game has been getting a lot of flack over... The length of the game and that's really strange because look at the game that I'm playing right now um, this game is not very long at all I mean we are talking like you could beat this game like that but it is still considered a classic because of the fact that even though it itself is a very short game uh, the game is highly replayable. You know, both by yourself or with a friend. And that's something very important to note. I mean, there's, um, you know, co-op would have definitely been a big saving grace for The Order 1886 uh, because of the fact that, you know, being able to share your experience with friends means you'll want to play through it again. Uh, most likely. I mean, that's assuming you enjoy the game, of course. You know, I guess a similar game to the Order 1886 is uh, the Gears of War series. All of them have had a multiplayer component of some type. Co-op, uh, competitive, and, you know, so on. And, uh, you know, even though the, the Gears games themselves are fairly short, you know, probably within the same range of time as the Order 1886 campaign is. It offered the player more to do. And that's something that, uh, you know, that's something that a short game needs to keep in mind. Is that if you're making your game to be able to play through it in a day... You need to be able to offer the player some kind of incentive to go back to the game. 
Uh, you could have the shortest game in the world if you give people reasons to come back to it. Now, multiplayer seems like the easy answer to it, but it's not necessarily needed. Uh, I want to share an example uh, of my brother. Uh, whenever he got an Xbox 360, um, I actually bought him a copy of uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I know, I know, shoot me down, right? Because, I mean, Call of Duty apparently is a trashy series now. But this was back when, uh, back in 2007 or whatever, when Modern Warfare was praised for being such an excellent game and all that good stuff. You know, I mean, the, the times are different, right? Uh, but um, he didn't have online for like several months after he got the Xbox 360. You know, he, he, he was playing mainly single player. And the thing is, that game gave you a lot of reasons to go back to single player. Um, for instance, you had the different difficulty settings, of course. But you also had different modes like the arcade mode, which allow you to build up like a high score. And, uh, you know, of course, you had like the achievement hunting and whatnot. And then, of course, you had the multiplayer. You had online as well as local multiplayer. The game had a lot to offer for $60, even though its campaign was fairly short. You can probably beat that game in about five to six hours easily. Uh, you know, that and that's, you know, maybe even shorter. You know, if you get, if you go on easy with like practically no deaths, you might be able to do it in about four hours. Uh, but it gave you reasons to come back to the game. And that's something that developers that are making short single player type games need to realize is you have to give the player some kind of incentive to return to the game on top of, you know, obviously making a good game. Now the order 1886 could be like the greatest game ever. It's obviously not. If you look at the opinions that people have out had out there but there might be like a few people out there to think it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread but are they going to have much of a reason to come back to it you know i mean even if it was a great game there's really not a lot of reason to come back to it because they didn't really design the game in that manner Okay, so before we go into the final part of the video, I do want to kind of disclose some final thoughts I do have on The Order 1886. Even though I do enjoy it as a game, and I think that it is a well-made game, I do stand by the fact that my theory that I had during this video on the game didn't have a lot to offer outside of the one playthrough holds quite true, because the game doesn't really have much to offer in ways of difficulty or any kind of emergent gameplay uh, that you can experience like pretty much everybody's playthrough is going to be very similar there's not a lot of variation between any of that stuff and so that's kind of one thing that is disappointing about the game so that's one reason why i think this game isn't worth more than ten dollars is because you might play through it maybe once or twice and that's pretty much it I mean, there's really not much more to it, even if you really enjoy the game, just because you're generally going to get the same experience every time. And that's kind of a sad thing to see, but that's something that people that make short games need to realize, is that they need to be able to provide us experiences that will last well beyond the single playthrough. You know, experiences that can actually give us some variation on the subject. So let's go ahead and get into the closing thoughts of the video. We have to realize, you know, that uh, when you're buying a video game versus, say, buying a movie, you know, you're usually pay paying about $20 for a brand new movie. And that's only going to be a couple of hours, right? But you're going to have a lot of extras, typically, when you're buying a movie, like uh, the commentary tracks, uh, behind the scenes stuff deleted scenes you know all kinds of stuff like that so a two-hour movie can easily stretch up to 10 hours um, with that extra content plus if it's a really good movie you're probably going to watch it again and again you're probably going to watch it several times um over the course of the years and it's so that it's okay for a game to be only five or six hours long as long as it has that kind of extra content uh, to enjoy, on top of being a good game, of course. 
you know, I mean, you obviously have games like uh, Skyrim, which can easily stretch over 100 hours. And, you know, I love Skyrim. If you look on my Steam playlist, you know, you see that I've played it for over 150 hours. But I can definitely guarantee that a good chunk of that time was playing the game through, like, slow areas. You know, there wasn't a lot going on in the game. You know, you had a lot of exploration and things like that. You know, it's, it was that kind of game. You know, you had a big, huge map. And you're going to have a lot of moments where there's not a lot of action in the game. So, obviously, when you're designing a game in that manner, it's quite easy to stretch it out over that time. You know, given that the game designers designed it that way. They designed it to be a huge game that the players can explore every nook and cranny and do every single little thing. And... That's the kind of experience it is. But that doesn't mean that that's the only kind of game that's worth $60, you know. Um, like I said, you know, a really short game can easily be worth $60. You know, one of the one of my favorite games of last year was Infamous Second Son. That's not exactly a very long game. You could probably beat it in, I don't know, 10 to 15 hours. But it did give you reasons to come back. Because, for one, you had the... Um, different morality system so you can do the good side and then the evil side in a subsequent playthrough um so that pretty much doubles the uh, length of the gameplay even though a lot of stuff will be the same you know but at the same time you get different powers and you know sequence of events will happen a little bit differently uh you know whether you're playing as the good or the bad side you know even the dialogue will change a little bit and you know just little things like that and on top of that, of course, you know, if the game has, you know, that game also had some side activities that you could do. And that adds a little bit of time, too, because you can probably spend a few hours just goofing around in that game, you know, doing the various side activities and whatnot. And so, you know, it's not, it, it didn't have any kind of, like, multiplayer component or anything of that nature. So that's fine, you know, and, and then, of course... You know, you get to the DLC version of the first light, you know, it was even shorter. Obviously, it was cheaper, too. But it had a lot of the different challenge modes and things like that to kind of extend uh, the gameplay that people have. You know, I mean, pe game developers need to realize that, you know, people have strict budgets. And if they want their games to sell at full price instead of people waiting on price drops and whatnot, they need to give some justification to that price. Um, if you're making a short single player only experience, you need to give players reasons to revisit that game. Um, you know, other than the storyline, you know, I mean, we have to realize that story in video games has came a long way. But sometimes people just want to play and we need to give them ways to keep on playing. So... That's my thoughts on this here. You know, I really don't think it's a problem that games are that short. I think it's a problem if there's no reasons to revisit those games. So, uh, let me know what your guys' thoughts are in the comments below. Uh, till then, down Phoenix out. Okay, so that part of the video isn't podcast friendly because there's not comments on podcasts. You don't just comment on a podcast, although technically you can. If you're listening to on like Podomatic, for example, you can actually drop a comment on the particular podcast. But you could email the Down Phoenix Show at gmail.com if you actually wanted to share some insights on your thoughts on short games or the Order 1886 or anything like that we've discussed so far or anything that we're about to discuss. For example, I did want to talk about my brief thoughts on the Call of Duty World War II beta since I did have a chance to play that. I still want to talk about some games that I've played recently and the Call of Duty series is one that I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with. There's been games that I've liked more than others of course for obvious reasons and lately it's been more hate than like. Uh, the last one I liked, of course, was Black Ops 3, and then before that it was Black Ops 2. As you can see, there's a bit of a trend with the Treyarch games being kind of fun. Although I did enjoy the story mode for Call of Duty Ghosts, that was not too bad. 
But anyways, I did want to talk about the uh, War II beta. You know, it did have a lot of similarities to the CODs that we've had before. Nothing has been groundbreakingly changed as far as that's concerned. But there were a couple of things that really uh, caught my eye with this game. First of all, it seemed like a lot of the stuff that was in previous games has been stripped down to a bit. It seems like it's a little more simplified than it used to be, uh, particularly with kill streaks and various things like that and the way that you set up weapons and perks. Uh, it's definitely more so complex than some of the old games like Modern Warfare 1 and World at War, but it is decidedly less complex than something like Infinite Warfare. Uh, also, there is a really nice mode called War, which plays nothing like anything we've seen in Call of Duty. The best way I can describe the War mode is it's essentially like playing something like Battlefield or Overwatch, where you have uh, evolving and changing objectives. So you can have one side that's defending an objective while the other side is trying to take that objective. And if that side successfully takes that objective within a time limit, the map will kind of change and evolve and it will actually morph into a slightly different objective. And that's a really cool and interesting way to play the game. I'm still not 100% sure if I'm going to get World War II at launch, but if I do, that's probably the mode I'm going to be playing a lot of, because that was quite a lot of fun. Crikey! You guys won't believe this. South Park Fractured Butthole is coming out in Australia. Yes. First of all, it's coming out in Australia. That alone is crazy news, because if you have ever seen any news articles about how Australia seems to treat games, they love to censor the hell out of them, if they even come out at all. Uh, apparently, it's going to come to Australia. And that's not the biggest surprise of this news story, people. It is also going to be uncensored. It is going to be the exact same content that we're going to have here in the States, that they're going to have in Europe, in Canada, and everywhere else they are releasing this game. This is a huge victory for Australian gamers that constantly have to deal with games that are censored to all hell if they even get them. There's a lot of games out there that have been banned in Australia. I just want to read down a list of games that are banned in Australia, just to kind of give you guys a little insight into this story here. 50 Cent Bulletproof. Not a big surprise, it's 50 Cent. 50's gotta be vulgar, right? Blitz the League. This one's kind of strange because it's a football game, but it's banned because of drug use. BMX Triple X. The Bug Butcher. Crimecraft, which with a name like that, probably not a big surprise. Dark Sector. Dreamweb. Enze, falsely acuted. Acuted, accused. This one's kind of strange because the first game wasn't banned, but this one is. Hotline Miami 2, wrong number. You're not playing that one in Australia, folks. Not at least by normal means. Leisure Suit Larry, Magnum Con Laud. Strangely enough, the only Leisure Suit Larry game on this list. Mark Echoes Getting Up Contents Under Pressure. Which is a graffiti-based game, really? Do we really need to ban a game based on graffiti? Are you guys that against graffiti? Then, of course, we have Manhunt. But interestingly enough, not Manhunt 2. I don't see it on this list, at least. May I Q, Labyrinth of Death. Never even heard of that game, but it's banned in Australia. You're not playing it, folks. Better import it. Narc. Not too surprising. We're talking about the 2005 Narc, by the way. Which, uh, you can drug use as a cop, so I guess there's a definite theme they don't have any fondness of drug use in video games. Then we got Necrovision. Paranautical Activity. These next twos are not at all a surprise. Postal and Postal 2. Those are banned in all kinds of countries, I'm pretty sure. Phantasmagoria. Reservoir Dogs. Risen. Saints Row 4, but not the others, interestingly enough. Why not? State of Decay. 
Shellshock 2 Blood Trails. Silent Hill Homecoming. Singles Flirt Up Your Life. Soldier of Fortune Payback. Know how violent that game is? Not a huge surprise. Interestingly enough, the first South Park The Stick of Truth was banned. Apparently though, they did make a modification to eventually re release it. Syndicate. The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings. Valkyrie Drive Picuni? Never even heard of it. And Voyeur. Again, never heard of it. But interestingly enough, you can play games like Duke Nukem 3D, Grand Theft Auto 3, Grand Theft Auto 4, as well as Left 4 Dead 2 and Mortal Kombat in Australia, among others. Those are all quite interesting. But hey, if you're an Australian, congratulations. You'll get to enjoy the fractured butthole in your own home. Okay guys, now it's time to have a laugh at my expense because there was a particular product that I discussed way back in the day that I thought was actually going to be successful. And once you listen to this, you're gonna laugh your ass off. I guarantee it. Hey guys, Dow Phoenix here. And I wanna throw up some thoughts about the PlayStation Vita TV. This is a very interesting device because it's a portable console that you play at home. There's not very many things like that. There have been a couple of instances like the Super Game Boy for the uh, Super Nintendo and the Game Boy Advance player for the GameCube. But generally speaking, you haven't been able to do that. Uh, definitely not with the uh, PlayStation systems. I guess you could with the PSP minis, I guess, to some degree on the PS3. But no, this is a Vita in a, you know, portable home console format. Uh, very interesting indeed. You know, HDMI out, Wi-Fi, Ethernet. Um, you know, it has the card slot for the Vita as well as the memory card slot. Very interesting indeed. And the price point is killer. Just a hundred bucks. That's cheap as dirt. I mean, considering that the Vita not long ago was $250 for the full package. And they lowered it to $200. They also, by the way, of course, announced a new Vita redesign, which is supposed to be like a little bit thinner and lighter. Um, supposed to have one gigabyte of memory built in now, so you don't have to buy a memory card anymore, which is great. It took them forever on that, by the way. And, um, you know, it's going to have a LCD instead of a uh, OLED display, which a lot of people are bitching about that. Like, just talking about the OLED display being so awesome. Man, it's definitely a very nice display. I think the color was a little oversaturated, and OLED displays don't exactly do the best in uh, outdoor environments so I think the choice to go with the LCD on top of it being cheaper for them is also the uh, better decision overall as far as the versatility but I mean it's still the Vita um, now there is one thing that I want to talk about with the uh, new Vita redesign it's got a micro USB port now and hopefully that will mean it could be connected to a TV as well through an MHL standard um, since a lot of smartphones use micro USB not just to charge but also to do docking and data connectivity including um, the MHL you know which allows them to mirror video onto a TV or monitor so hopefully they're planning on doing something like that with the original Vita but even if they don't the Vita TV will definitely fill that niche and I, I you know a lot of people are really criticizing this thing you know they're like making fun of it Ooh, handheld console without the screen <laughs> you know like like the whole one ds thing <laughs> but this actually is a good idea because what else costs a hundred dollars and ouya and you know any gamer worth their goal probably thinks that ouya is dead now because if sony releases this in america at that price point, it's game over for them. <laughs> oh man, I can't believe I said that. Wow. Now, in my defense, I do want to point out that Sony royally screwed up the way that they promoted this device. 
So, it's not entirely my fault. It's not like I had complete lack of sight, like Mr. Magoo, into the future. I just didn't realize that Sony was going to do such a terrible job with promoting this system. I mean, come on, Sony, the marketing genius that they had behind both the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. Yeah, they kind of missed up a little bit with the PS3, but they got it back. Stella got her groove back, and so when the Vita was announced, it was like, well, this is great, it's a sequel to the PSP, and the PSP was great, but no, they just really dropped the ball, and it's just so sad because they had such an excellent handheld device, the system itself was designed remarkably, and it had excellent hardware for the time for a handheld system. It's just that Sony did a complete blunder with the marketing, and I was kind of hoping with the redesign of the PS Vita, as well as the PlayStation TV, that they were turning it around. But this thing never even got Netflix. Come on! No Netflix? Because it's superior hardware. It's gonna have the app support. You know, you can get stuff like Netflix and Hulu on the Vita. You can't on the Ouya. The Ouya will be stuck with the indie apps that nobody cares about. Um, it's not going to pick up any major support like the Vita is, which... Uh, yeah, the Vita is kind of struggling against the 3DS and the smartphones, but I think with the uh, recent price drop, the new design, and then this particular device, that's all going to change. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is this PS Vita TV? Okay, so it's a small device. Um, they describe it as being about the size of a deck of cards. And yeah, it might be a little bit bigger than that, I guess. But anyways, um, it, it's basically a media device that also happens to be a Vita system. So... Out of the box, this device is designed to be a media streaming box, uh, like Roku, Apple TV, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, Google TV, that kind of stuff is what they're, you know, out of the box is what it's supposed to do. But, you know, it's got a card slot for the Vita, so you can put in Vita games as well as the memory cards. And you can also connect a DualShock 3 controller with it. Uh, now, the they're also going to bundle, I guess, uh, an 8GB card with the DualShock 3 so that you're Vita good to go out of the box for 150 is what they're aiming for right there. And But, you know, if you've already got a PlayStation 3, you don't need to have any more investment except for, I guess, the memory card. Which, if you already have a Vita, you don't even have to worry about that. So, you got that functionality. It'll play most Vita games. Now, it's not going to support ones that have specific features like the touch screen or the rear touchpad or the camera. You know, those kinds of games that require that functionality, you're not going to be able to play those. So, we're going to hope that Sony really pressures their software partners into updating their software to support the new system if it doesn't for some reason. Gravity Rush is going to be a big one. Uh, Uncharted Golden Abyss will be another. Uh, games that they'll need to patch to ensure this playback and um, you know but if they if they play their cards right with this I think this will be big even if they don't patch those games if Sony can I guess move that focus away from those features maybe just making those features optional and uh, you know figure out a way that they can map the second set of uh, you know trigger buttons um, for PS Vita TV games specifically then I think they got a real winner. You know, we're talking about a full-blown gaming console with media capabilities for under $100. Um, that's unheard of nowadays. You know, we got that's gonna be, that's gonna be cheaper than Nintendo Wii because that's 130 bucks. So, I mean, come on, a Vita versus a Wii? They don't make new games for the Wii anymore. So, obviously. The best choice in that case would be the Vita, because it would have the new games, the new software support. Um, it's got better graphics, you know. You're going to have, you know, all kinds of good classic support for PSP and PS1. And again, I totally thought that Sony was going to make sure that more games were going to work on the PlayStation TV. And if you look at the list of apps, there's only a few 
like Netflix, Redbox Instant, and Skype that you cannot use on the PlayStation TV. As a matter of fact, you can't use anything that's remotely important to stream videos on on the PlayStation TV. No Hulu, no YouTube, no Amazon, no nothing. Which is ironic because it's called the PlayStation TV. You can't watch TV on it. But anyways, there are a shocking number of games that do not work on the PlayStation TV. I mean, I could go over a whole bunch, but I'm just going to go over some more known titles, I guess you could say. Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation. Call of Duty Black Ops Declassified, which I heard is really terrible, but I'm not going to judge. Dragon Quest Builders, which is an excellent game. Doesn't work on the PlayStation TV, even though it's a game that it came out in 2016, and the PlayStation TV's been out for a good while. Why is it not on there? Uh, Hutsune Miku, Project Diva, Project Diva F. Hot Shots Golf, World Invitational. A couple of the Hyper Dimension Neptunia games. How about this? Lego Marvel Super Heroes. Little Big Planet. Wow, I can't do that. Can't do the Metal Gear Solid HD collection either. Mod Nation Racers. Mortal Kombat. Odd World New and Tasty. PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale. Ratchet and Clank Trilogy. Resistance Burning Skies. Civilization Revolution 2 Plus. Silent Hill Book of Memories. Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Oh boy, here's a big one. This one's embarrassing. Uncharted Golden Abyss. Yes, one of the biggest launch titles for the PlayStation Vita. Probably one of the only reasons that certain people even picked up this system. Can't play it on the PlayStation TV. Walking Dead Season 2, at least the physical copy. Well, that's great. So if you want to play it on the PlayStation TV, you have to play it digitally. Wipeout 2048, another major launch title. World of Final Fantasy, wow, again, another game that came out in 2016. Not supported by the PlayStation TV. XCOM Enemy Unknown Plus. Wouldn't it have been great to play a game like that at home after playing it to go? There are some others, of course, that I missed as well. Like Injustice, Gods Among Us, and Flower, FIFA 15, and many more. What a disaster, Sony. Where was the software support for this thing? Where was it? So, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to this device. I think it's going to be huge. I think that this device has the potential to help set off the set top box market but maybe I'm wrong you know I mean I guess you could say I'm a little biased because I'm a Sony fanboy not exactly true you know I um, you know I, I do love Sony products over Nintendo or Microsoft as far as gaming is concerned but I'm mainly a PC gamer in, in my opinion and uh, you know I do hate certain things that Sony does I just think that this was a brilliant idea um, you know the 1DS Everybody thought it was a joke. I was thinking, you know what, Nintendo did that? I'd buy that in a second. Um, Nintendo, of course, that, that that's too forward thinking for Nintendo that the 1DS was. Uh, the 2DS, more along their line of thinking. Their thinking is, let's market a product for young kids. Because young kids have jobs and income and spend money on video games. Yeah. No, their parents do. And that's that's the real market now. That's what Nintendo doesn't realize. Is that the average gamer has their own income and they spend more money on video games than they do for their kids. Their kids don't get very many games. Um, so that's something they need to work on. Sony's got the right idea though with this uh, PS Vita TV. I think this thing is gonna fly off the shelves. Uh, you can quote me if I'm wrong. If um, you know we look at this a year from now, and that thing is already off the market, and it's only sold like a hundred thousand units in the U.S. or something like that, then you guys have the full right to brag on me. But you know what? I'll probably be one of those hundred thousand people that bought it. So, um, 
yeah, I think this is definitely a better idea than what the PS uh, P Go or the you know PlayStation Go was. So I mean, come on, you're gonna have a DualShock Three controller instead of the the Vita controls that are built in, which honestly aren't that good. Um, the 3DS definitely has a better controller setup, I think, than the Vita. But um, yeah, regardless, I'm gonna get one. If they don't come out with this thing in the U.S., then I'll probably I'll probably eventually take the plunge and get the, one of the redesigned Vitas. But uh, if they do come out with this in the U.S., I'm gonna get it first day because it's gonna be just the right price, and there's a lot of good Vita games that I want to play. Oh, um, Persona 4 Golden. A lot of people have been mentioning. You'll be able to finally play that on TV now. Wouldn't that be great? Um, Soul Sacrifice, that'd be another one, you know. There's some good games out there that you'll be able to play on the TV, finally. If, um, you know, we're talking about Vita-exclusive games that don't have a release anywhere else. So that's going to be fantastic. I think that this thing is going to just do really well. I guess we'll find out for sure, because it comes out in Japan, I believe, in October or something like that. And that's where it's going to come out first. So we'll get a kind of idea of what the Japanese think of it. As far as that, it, it, that's kind of a tough sell for them because Japanese are definitely more into handhelds than they are to home consoles. If uh, you look at the sales statistics, but at the same time, when you look at this device, you know it's going to have the PlayStation 4 remote play capability, which I forgot about. To forgot to mention, that's going to be a big deal, I think, to some people. And then the fact that some of these, um, you know, portable gamers, you know. They might want to continue their game at home when they get at home. And well, how better to do it than on the biggest screen in the house? So I I guess we'll take a look at Japan, see how they feel about it. Uh, I'm going to tell you, though, I, I think it's going to be a big success. I think this might be the thing that's going to turn the Vita around. Because I don't think the $50 price drop is going to be enough. But I think this will. Wow, now that was insightful. I try to call him like I see him, but sometimes you just make the wrong call. So, that being said, I rather do enjoy the PlayStation TV. If you can find one for cheap, it makes for an excellent little portable console. You can play most Vita games. I mean, I know I mentioned a lot previously, but the large majority of them still play just fine on it. As a matter of fact, some of the ones that you that I mentioned, if you mod it, you can actually play those games anyways. There are ways to do it. Um, it also plays PSP games, and there are tons of great PSP games. Not to mention PlayStation 1 Classics. Also, you can mod your Vita, or your, your PlayStation TV. You can mod both, actually, but you can mod it and load up with emulators. All the way up to the PS1. I think it can do in 64, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe not. Oh, that's something they've been working on. Uh, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Nintendo. All that good stuff. Good times, indeed. But, um... That being said, it failed. Because Sony didn't have faith in it. And they didn't support it. And why would an average gamer want to support a device that... The company that puts out the device doesn't support? Indeed, indeed. I mean, look at the way that Microsoft turned their fortunes around for the Xbox One. After the initial launch, it kind of had a really rough start. And the PlayStation 4 was pulling way ahead. But Microsoft did persevere. They did hold on to their horses. And they made some changes to improve the fortunes of the Xbox One. And now, yes, they're still fairly good behind, but at the same time... The people that have an Xbox One, they're probably a little more happy with it now than they were three years ago. I would wager, at least. And that's a good thing. These companies, they need to have faith in their products. They need to back these products with their full support. If they can expect any success out of it whatsoever. What was the point of Sony spending all that time and money, all that manpower on designing the PlayStation Vita, on designing the PlayStation TV, if they were just going to abandon it so frivolously. Sony has been completely lucky with the PlayStation 4. It's not that they did something really special with the PlayStation 4 
that had gamers flock to it. No, they just didn't make the same mistakes your competitors did. Gamers saw what Nintendo and Microsoft did with the Wii U and the Xbox One. And they saw that, hey, Sony's not making that mistake, so I'm going to go with Sony. But the thing is, Sony didn't really do anything that said, hey, you know what? We might be making mistakes too, but we got this awesome content that we're bringing to you guys. They didn't bring that to us. It took a good while before we got some really solid exclusives for the PS4. Whereas the Xbox One actually had a couple of really good ones right out of the gate. Sony just completely lucked out with the PlayStation 4. You can see it with the way they're handling the PlayStation 4 Pro and the PlayStation VR. They're not exactly the runaway successes that everybody thought they were. Even though they are backed by the most powerful home console lineup that we've seen in a long time, since the PlayStation 2. Yet, they're having a hard time moving those devices. And meanwhile, we've got reports of the Xbox One S pre-orders, One S, One X pre-orders, actually doing really good. So, I hope Sony can get their act together the next time they release a platform, because they have to stop resting on their laurels. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, this remix, rewind, as you will, of the DP and Me podcast. Next week, we're going to have our special guests, and I think you guys will have a great time listening to the episode. If you guys enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share it with your friends. And if you want to know everywhere you can listen to this, this podcast is on iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, and YouTube. Just search for DP and me or The Down Phoenix Show at your preferred venue and you will find the podcast. Um, if you have any trouble finding the podcast at another venue, just email me at thedownphoenixshow at gmail.com or tweet me at Down Phoenix, and I will hit you up and give you that information. But thank you again for listening. Until then, Down Phoenix out. Subscribe to the DP and me on the iTunes. Do now. Get to the chopper. Get cookie down now.